Welcome back to the Tuned In Tony podcast. I've got my guy, Sean Alinery, on the show with me today. Your career happiness equals your purpose multiplied by progress. Everyone wants to be happy, but you have to do both. And you do that by being an engaging leader. Sean is a cannabis tech exec, owns his own company called Corporate Dad, where he's working on workshops for corporate individuals and just teaching them a whole bunch of things. And it's actually based off the super popular book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which many of you guys have probably read. So welcome, Sean, to the show. I look forward to talking to you, breaking down plenty of game for people who are in the uh, executive space, want to learn about cannabis, and also just want to learn about how to get into tech corporately. So welcome, Sean. Man, my guy, I am happy to be here. This is be a dope conversation yeah yeah dope conversation yeah. so sean and i are really good friends and then i was just like bro like i like to give people a lot of good topics right and then it's like a lot of them are entrepreneurial yeah. but you're an entrepreneur in yourself because he also does real estate as well but his main gig is working in a cannabis tech company and i was just like let's get some of that game for the working people who are entrepreneurial as well so what that actually brings me to for my first question is what is it like being an entrepreneur oh man so you have you have the benefit of for one mm-hmm. a bigger safety net <laughs> right 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 when you know you have that cushion but the reality of it is in this market and I, and I grew up when I say grew up as an adult in the last recession we saw coming out of 2008 so you know it's not really that safe so the reality of it is we have to make sure when you are working for organizations you're building within them Facts. You're not just in a position where, hey, I'm here to get a check. I'm just going to do what's my job description is. No, I'm going to make myself an organization who's partnering with this other company in order for us to have a common goal. So I say, look at it like you have your own business. You ink, mm-hmm. you walk in the room and now what are the services you're providing? Right. Right. What do you bring to the table for that organization to want to keep? investing in you and driving revenue to your business. Got you, got you. And what I like about what you're saying as well is because, you know, me being an entrepreneur, you being exact, we use some of the same softwares that we were talking about Slack. But what, what is really cool about your side of the table is just hearing where it's like, you get all the things that an entrepreneur aspires to have, such as like a secretary teams, all of these people. But like you said, it's not on your expense, but you get to put your knowledge to it. You get to build, build those efficiencies or whatever. So that's definitely super cool. So my question now comes to like, um, how does somebody go from just having like normal job to actually getting to that exact level where they have these teams? Oh yeah. So, so the reality for me Going back to it, I'm not the Ivy League educated guy, right? Right. I don't have a degree from Harvard. I didn't go to Princeton. To be honest, I don't even have my bachelor's. Oh, for real? Nah. I am a college dropout. But before that, Mm -hmm. I was a high school dropout. Wow. So I was that kid at 19 years old watching all my friends go off to college. Now, I've always been high IQ. I've been great at tests, but I just Mm -hmm. wasn't a great student. Yeah. And here I am living in a car you know, bumming on floors, couches, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And I'm in a position where I'm like, I got to turn my life around. Like, Mm. this is not going to be me because I, you know, I have my braids. I have my tall teeth. So I look like your common stereotype. This is this thug who's not going to turn his life around. Right. So I was able to change that and climb the, the, the ranks as an executive. Mm -hmm. And I did it in a way where it was okay. You know, started off in retail, working retail jobs I had three jobs at one point walking to work, right? Because I got to a point where my tag on my car was expired and I got too many tickets. Right. So it's like, okay, in order to get yourself back on your feet, you're going to have to sacrifice a little bit. Right. So until you can get that EGR valve fixed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you're going to have to do is walk to work. Yeah. So I, I had my early hack of I would go work at women's retail stores. Mm. And, and for me, I learned it's the easiest place to get a job right? because they always need men who can break down boxes, do stock work. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you get to still do cashier work and, and, and fitting room work. So it was one of those things where I could walk in a place, get a job real quick, use right. the charm, use the charisma mm-hmm. and use the body to do some hard labor. Right. Um, and at this point, you know, for my life started to turn around. I'm working there. I'm working at finish line. Mm. And then I get a job at Walgreens and I'm working all mm. three at the same time. Get my car where it needs to be. Now I can drive. Yeah. So I'm going to get one car um, and get get one job. I'm just working at Walgreens and I worked my way up to the pharmacy. And then I leveraged that to hop over into contact centers. And the reason why I did that was that 
Now it's on the pharmaceutical support side. So mm. Like what's tech Contact support? centers, like people on the phone calling. A job that most people hate, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the thing about it is we, we tend to look at those jobs, right, as a curse or a burden. Mm-hmm. For me, it was, wait a minute, I've been working in retail for X number of years. Now mm-hmm. I get to sit down all day, right? Yeah. I'm in an office. I just got to talk to people. So yeah. I, I loved it. And I got paid probably almost double what I was making, mm-hmm. you know, as a cashier. Are those jobs hard just because they have so like your... As soon as you hang up, someone's calling, you got these stats to hit, like, because that's what I know of, right? Yeah. Everyone's like, there's no other job. I got a job where I'm from at the Verizon call center or yeah. whatever. They're calling people about upgrades, called cellular sales, right? Yes. And then everyone hates it. Yeah. So what did you love about it versus like, since that's kind of unorthodox, I would say. Yeah. So the biggest difference I noticed mm-hmm. working in a contact center versus anywhere else was you actually had career paths. You right. actually had development. Mm-hmm. And you got consistent coaching. Whereas when I worked in retail, maybe my manager would, hey, don't fold it like that. Okay, right. cool. But we didn't really get that consistent feedback on how to do better. Whereas in a contact center, I'm looking around, I'm saying, wait a minute, what is a quality assurance analyst? How do I get in that role? What's a right. workforce analyst? You know, what's a trainer? So I'm starting to see, okay. Different teams, different departments. Teams. Oh, different, le- multiple leadership structure. Wait a minute. So you telling me I can go from being a frontline rep to a lead, to a supervisor, to a manager, to a director. Okay, what's going on? So working in the contact center, I just noticed I have more opportunity to level up. And I think it's a mindset change. It's like, okay, I can either be here and complain about it, Mm -hmm. or I can say I'm about to do what I have to do here and get to that next level to change my life. Because being in that space, I didn't need a degree to get into management. I just needed to prove that I can do my job well and then prove I can lead other lead Mm. others. So what I'm hearing as well is like the world tells us so much that like you have to do it this way in order to be successful. Go to high school, graduate, go to a four year school, graduate, maybe get in, do internships, get a master's degree. Then you can get a job. Yes. You said I'm a high school dropout (laughs) and a college dropout. And now you make over six figures. Right. So it is possible. Oh, yeah. Right. So people listening to that, would you say like the the. The strategy is to like get the certifications you need or do that, or do they just need to go the school route? No. So the way I recommend it, it's different for everybody. Right. You know, the way I view it is when it comes to school, sometimes you need a degree for what you do, whether it's engineering, accounting, finance, uh, law, medical, Mm -hmm. you definitely want a degree. However, there's certain degrees that just don't make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody's going to school for psychology. Mm-hmm. Business administration, like a lot of these roles don't necessarily have the best return on investment. Mm-hmm. And you just see them ending up working in retail roles anyway. Right. 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 So, you know, my stance on it is put yourself in the market. My mom used to tell me she was like, your friends are in school now. Right. So what you want to do is you want to make sure by the time they graduate, you have four years of experience working. Because mm-hmm. that four years of experience will be equivalent to you getting your degree. Right. And and now you can keep up with the market because now I'm already ahead of them. So I started noticing my career turnaround. So you got to think about it. 19, I was homeless. At 28, I was a director. Mm. At 29, I was a vice president. Mm. So you have, so within that time frame, by the time I was 29, my, you know, my peers were still just like frontline. They weren't even supervisors yet. Right. But it's because I got in there early on and I, and I learned these three key lessons. Like, okay. How do you go from being this frontline person to an executive? What, what was how, what was the path to get there? Mm-hmm. For me, number three, the bottom. Mm-hmm. Everybody talks about work ethic. Forget that. Right. It's not about that. What's it about? Study ethic. Mm. So we live in an age where you have this thing called YouTube. You have podcasts. You have all these amazing things at your fingertips with Google. Study all the time. I always tell somebody, if you want to get into marketing, what you need to do is just watch a bunch of videos, listen to a bunch of fireside chat interviews of marketing executives Mm -hmm. and what'll happen is you'll start picking up on the lingo they're using you start picking up on where the trends are going for the industry you'll start understanding what their kpis are so when you walk in those interviews or in those rooms you already sound just like them right so you want to be able to study so for me it was leadership i knew i wanted to grow in leadership so i'm always listening to leaders so the way i talk the way i carry myself the way i walk in the room changed because i'm watching these amazing leaders and i'm like okay I see how the CEO, how this VP, how this director moves. Now I'm picking that up. Now I'm taking these lessons and carrying it along the way. So study ethic. Number Mm. two, the biggest problem I see, to be honest, between my generation, millennials, we, our careers don't tell a story, right? Too many of us are trying to start over. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you start working one career career path. You're like, oh, I don't like this. Let me go back to school. Let me start something else. Or mm-hmm. let me get a certificate and start something else. Mm-hmm. Every time you start over, you're starting from the bottom. You're coming in entry level. That's deep, yeah. And we know you get paid based on experience. Whether or not you are an entrepreneur who's a plumber or whether or not you are a corporate accountant. The more mm. experience you have, you can charge more rates because you have more experience. Right. So we always reset that bar. So my career told a story. No matter what I did, it mm-hmm. all flowed and made, made sense. So I always say, for example, let's say you want to move into sales, but you're in accounting. Right. Well, the way you can stitch that together is you can move into comp uh, planning. So you can right. say, okay, I'm in accounting now. Let me start doing some, some helping the sales team out with their projections and doing some comp models for them. Then I get an actual rollover in sales. Now when you interview for that role, it's like, oh, you already understand how we work. You understand our commission structure. You understand all this. So now I want to bring you over to that team. Mm, and what I like about that as well is just like, like you said, that's most people are restarting. I hate my job. Restart. Yes. Hate my job. Restart. But it's like you said, like, all right, yeah, I used to do this. Intertwine that so that you can keep value stacking yes. everything that you've done. So, yeah, that that's super important right there. What was your first product or service that you guys were selling at your call center? Oh, man, we were doing, so I was on the medical side. So we okay. were doing prior authorizations. For what the part of, of the country were you? I was in Georgia, but working for the state of Texas. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, so was this remote work before remote work was cool? No, I wish. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> so you were in a center but the company you're doing the calls for in Texas. Exactly. So gotcha. we worked for a major company that Xerox ended up acquiring and we mm-hmm. were considered an outsourcer. Um, but each state has their own regulations for Medicaid. Mm-hmm. So we're having to have doctor's offices basically call into us. And as pharmacy techs, we got to know all these medications. And we had to know, OK, what? You know, can we approve this this patient at this time for this drug, even though it's not a part of their approved list? Mm-hmm. And we go through a look at criteria, and I would be the person who said approved or denied. Right. So very transactional, not really a lot of customer experience. That first job was really about um, intellect and basically being as efficient as possible. Whereas then you tra- start to transition over to more customer experience roles. Got you. So before we get to like the cannabis, which people want to talk about. When you're working a call center job, right, like before where you are now, how do you find the like the oof to keep doing that? Because like I'm in my head right now, I'm imagining you're calling people, they're hanging up on you and you're like, you know, it's just it's it's beating you down. Right. Yeah. So how do you do that for months to even years? Well, I, I think that the thing about it is you start off happy in that role you mm-hmm. first get that job you're like oh man i can't wait to get out i just got yeah. trained you're out there you're, you're supporting your customers you're learning new things you you have peers that are giving you feedback mm-hmm. and what happens is you end up becoming a top performer then over time that starts to burn you out right it's, it's, it can get monotonous and consistent and the problem is is because you haven't grown right so i always tell people you got to think about career happiness period and to me that's a simple formula You know, Mm -hmm. I always say your career happiness is your purpose multiplied by progress. So when you're in a position where it's like, okay, you know what? I may love doing this call center work. I love doing tech support. I love being able to solve my customers' problems. It's my purpose. But if over time you're not seeing yourself progress and get to higher levels or move into different roles, you start to hate what you're doing because you don't have that progression. And the same goes where if you can be in a position where they're now promoting you, you're getting new roles and new opportunities if, if you're not working your purpose, it's not something you actually care about. What ends up happening is, you know, you don't want to be there either. So you have to have that balance of I'm doing what I love, but I'm progressing in my career. So you, and, and once you do that, you feel great. So a lot of the contacts and reps, I say, if you're burnt out now, that means you didn't exit in a timely fashion. Gotcha. Right now, you should have been doing something else on this path. So to me, that contacts in a role is a stepping stone to get you to the next level. Got you. And what was the extension ladder that got you to the next step? after you were working at that first call center, like how did you elevate to not exactly where you are now, but like, what was the next gig? You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I did three more years of contact center work. Okay. And then for me, I ended up losing my job, you know, mm. and in contact center attendance is important. I got fired. Dang. <laughs> Why'd you get fired? <laughs> attendance. Okay. 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 <laughs> you know, in, in, uh, you know, I was just in a position where you have a certain amount of points you can accrue and I accrued too many. Mm-hmm. And that was tough. You know, I had a family already at the time. So I'm looking, I'm saying, okay, this isn't going to, this isn't going to work. I got to be able to provide for the family. Right. So I ended up, uh, having an opportunity to move into a workforce analyst role, which is more analytical, more data driven, had never done it before. 
And that was the opportunity that kind of changed everything for me, where it's like, okay, now I'm in this workforce analyst role. Was this the company that you worked for overseas? Yes. So, okay. so started off here in Atlanta, mm -hmm. technically in Kennesaw. I'm driving an hour and a half to work every Dang. day. You mm -hmm. know, first week of work, my car engine dies and I had to get yeah. a whole new car. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm excited because my first time ever being on salary. So I'm thinking I'm doing something right. 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 But, you know, sh shortly after joining that company, I was put in a position where my leadership team had left to, to go to a different company. So, yeah. And my peers worked in Utah. So I'm like, OK, I'm the only one here in Georgia. The other two guys are in Utah. Either I step it up or they're going to lay me off. Right. So I stepped it up and I said, I'm the senior analyst. I'm mm -hmm. now the leader of this department. You gave yourself that role. Gave myself that role. No yeah. official promotion. I How long did it take for the higher ups to see that you had done that? Oh, man, it took about nine months before I officially got promoted to supervisor. OK. You know, and at that time we were covering six days a week. There were only yeah. three of us covering seven days. So we each had to work six days and I'm closing one day, opening the next day, you know, mm -hmm. so. Me and those two guys, we really put all of our energy out there to support that program. And I mm -hmm. think eventually it was rewarded. And about a year after I became a supervisor, that's when I had an opportunity where I had a new leader over me now. And she's based in Mexico. Mm -hmm. She's from Wisconsin. She's from the U.S. like me, doesn't speak Spanish. Right. And at the time, she was a regional director. And she's like, I tell her, I said, hey, I would like to hire another guy in Utah. You know, I'm sure I got another guy in Georgia now. But they need about two more people. So she says, wait a minute. I'm here in Mexico. Mm -hmm. What if we hired... People here in Mexico, you train them and we get them up and running. It'd be lower cost. You could hire a bigger team. I'm like, that'll be perfect. So I'm right. ready to hire five people. I'm excited. A couple of days later, she calls me back and she's like, how do you feel about moving to Mexico? And you're like, Mexico? Yeah. Like, I've never been out the country, like lived out the country. So had yes. you even been out the country at that no, point? No, not at okay. all. So, Where was your family? Yeah. Were you married at this point? Oh, yeah. We just okay. got married. So got you. Wife and I, we had a four-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, she was pregnant with our next one. So this is a big move. Oh, big. Yeah. You know, and then one of the hardest decisions I had to make, you yeah. know, personally with extended family, also with us as a family, but my wife had my back. She was like, let's do it. Yeah. Let's just go for it, mm -hmm. you know? And and taking that opportunity, I got promoted to manager and I got an opportunity to relocate and build this team from scratch in Mexico. Mm. And how long were you there? Oh, I was there almost a year and a half. So mm. as I'm building this group out, you know, I started off with the off with just those five. By the time I left, I want to say it was like 17 people mm -hmm. on my team. And I had built multiple departments there. Yeah. And and, you know, what I love about working with teams overseas is the stories. Yeah. Like the things you learn, like we think here in the U.S. that we're going through things. Right. And we are for the most part. But there's different levels to it. You know, I had a gentleman on my team who used to live in the U.S., mm -hmm. met his wife and lived in Arizona. Mm -hmm. They had three beautiful kids. He was, I believe, like an engineer at the time. He's making 70,000 a year a year in, 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 in Arizona. Right. Doing well for himself. Situation happens. He gets deported. Mm hmm. His wife was born in the U.S. Yeah. His kids were born in the U.S. Right. But they decided to move with dad and husband mm. to Mexico. So now he's there living in his, his aunt's pool house with his whole family, which really it was like a shed, mm -hmm. you know, and you're talking about a family of what, five at the time. Um, he's making probably four bucks an hour as a contact center agent in Mexico. Mm. So think about going from making 70,000 a year. We're talking, this is like 2012. Yeah. So factor in inflation, he's probably making like a hundred grand mm -hmm. to all of a sudden making pennies on the dollar. Mm. So when you say he's making $4 an hour, is this literally like the big companies just outsourcing their work to overseas for pennies on the dollar, like you're saying, and we call to make an exchange for some product we purchase online, we hear a different accent. This is what you're going through, right? Exactly. Like you're seeing this real time. Exactly. Okay. So, you know, he, he's in that position, right, where, and, and, and to be honest, the money was still good out there as far as $4 an hour is not bad. Mm -hmm. Like, But when you're talking about taking care of, you know, three kids and a wife, and I don't believe she was necessarily working at the time because she was not originally from that country, mm -hmm. it's just not enough to get on your feet. Right. So he was in a position where I gave him an opportunity, significantly bumped up his pay right. as an analyst on my team. About less than a year later, I ended up having to take on another department that pretty much was like, hey, we need you to take on this team. That entire team just quit. Mm -hmm. We want you to be able to take it on. And this is the team that does all of our login administration for the entire company. Mm. So if you think about any credentials, you're a new employee, your employee leaving, you can't access any system without this team uh, getting you on board. And it was like 14,000 employees at the time. So I, I looked at him and I said, hey, I need you to step up and take this team over. What are mm -hmm. your thoughts? He stepped up. I made him a supervisor of that team. He turned it around in like two days and had the company still going. No, none of our clients knew. No one felt it, right? Because mm -hmm. he got that team up and running. And the last time I saw him, 
he went from that shed making $4 an hour to making a, a very strong salary and building a house for himself. And he was showing mm. me his house that he had built for his Dang, family. Dang, you changed his life. Oh, and, and that's to me why I'm so obsessed with leadership. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of times you look at leadership and we're like, oh, it's so much work and I don't want yeah. to deal with other people. But I always say leadership is the single most easiest way to build wealth in your life. Mm -hmm. Like, and build wealth for others because as you grow, you create opportunities. You're like a tree right. and you're planting more seeds. Mm. So don't run away from leadership. Lead, leadership, lean into it. If you don't know it, learn more about it. Yeah. Fireside Chats, podcast, YouTube, you know, going back, yeah. read some books where it, it's all out there for us to learn. Right. But if I didn't have that opportunity, if I didn't relocate, mm -hmm. if I didn't believe in myself as a leader, even though I was not a good one until my team trained me how to be a good leader there, mm -hmm. he wouldn't have had that opportunity to turn his life around. Got you. So what would you say? Are you saying, would you say that call center would be like, if someone's kind of like, don't, doesn't know what their passion is, they're trying to find a good career path to go on. What advice would you give them for call centers? Cause I think a lot of people look past it. And the reason why I ask you this question is cause what I'm learning from listening to your story is the fact that it's like, all right, undesirable position for most, right? Then you get in here, but I'm looking at all the training. Well, this is the position where it's not desirable, like possibly retail. I'm going to be in the mall. It's cute. Yeah. I'm going to work with this group where there's more opportunity for me to delegate, build teams, you know, have to uh, kill and conquer all of that. You know what I'm saying? So it seems like even though it may be an undesirable at first, it's so much learning and gems inside of that field. Yes. You know, I, I think to be honest, in any field, mm -hmm. you have an opportunity for growth. It's up to you to lean into it. Right. Period. The contact center structure makes it easier for you because it literally benefits by you being better mm. because it's so measurable. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking, we get customers giving you a satisfaction survey right afterwards. Right. Yep. You have quality assurance analysts who are what they're doing is every time you're on a call or a chat or an email, they're scoring a percentage of those to say, how did you do? What could you have improved? Oh, you're missing product knowledge. Oh, you have soft skill challenges where you're just rude to customers or, yeah. you know, or you need more training in this area. And then they'll let your manager know. And now you're getting coaching because our goals are tied back to your performance. Mm. So whenever you have a role, same with sales, when your performance ties back to the overall company objectives, mm -hmm. there's a bigger opportunity for growth. Mm. And because of how it's structured, like I said, you have, I can go down the individual contributor career path and become an analyst or go to a different department. Like, for example, my team at my company now, I have a team of technical support, you know, specialists, but also engineers on my team. Mm -hmm. And these people are solving complex problems. They're solving bugs and codes, et cetera. And if they want to say, you know what, I would love to move into the R&D space, they have that opportunity. Or if I would love to move into customer success. So there's so many career paths. And to be honest, the ideal employee is the person who talks to your customers every day. Yeah. So if you know them, the They're voice the front line my, workers. Exactly. So I would love to promote you to come over here to marketing because you know exactly what customers are wanting to hear, right? Mm. So it's about tapping into that group. So I always say, don't be afraid to run towards that contact center job yeah. if, if you're down for it. Yeah. And then like what you said, them being like on the front line, so many people can look at that position like, oh, they're just, you know, doing the minion work, right? Yeah. But for anybody who is a higher up, those are the people that are hearing every single problem yeah. with your product or your service. They're the ones seeing like the most, they're the most knowledgeable of what needs to be changed that can literally take your business from being not profitable to profitable. Yeah. Because even if you just take the time to listen, they're just like, yeah, our customers think that this part of our service is just not good. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Maybe we can get rid of that. So those are things to ask. So my question now would be like, when did you grow out of that uh, position in Mexico? When were you oh. like, it's time to come back to the States? What was it? Yeah. So I can't I relocated back to the States this time. Now I'm a senior manager. So I mm -hmm. went from, you know, I was there for five senior years. Senior manager, same company. He's same company. Okay. So there for almost five years, went from an analyst, senior analyst, supervisor, manager, global manager, which is really a senior manager. Um, and back in the U S the money I was making just didn't stretch, mm -hmm. you know, whereas living in Mexico, I felt like, okay, we got you a nice like lifestyle. Yeah. And then, you know, I came, came back to the U S and it's like, okay, my team in Mexico is running great. I think I have a great replacement. And here's, here's a tip for leaders. Every single team that you're leading, always identify someone who can replace you. Mm. If you have multiple, that's great. And what you want to do is pour into them. Leaders mm -hmm. often, especially new leaders, they get scared. 
And like, this scarcity too, mindset. Exactly. They're like, if I make them too well, they don't need me. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't need you in this role. Mm-hmm. So as a leader, I can't get promoted if my leader does not believe that if I leave, this department will still function just as good as it was when yeah, I was here. Yeah, because they're going to keep you there because they're like, we need that. We're running. Exactly. Yeah. So you always want to make sure you create a better version of yourself so you can move on. And when you're a leader, it's not about you anymore. It's right. about how great is that team performing. Right. So you go from being Michael Jordan and you're dominating, you're doing great. Oh, top performer, always hitting the KPIs. Mm-hmm. Once you become a leader, you're Phil Jackson. Yeah. No one cares about your jump shot anymore. Mm-hmm. Can you create five more versions of yourself? Yeah. Right. So you got to be able to do that. So when I, when I look at the situation and I'm saying, okay, my team is strong now. I have a solid replacement. It's time for me to find a job outside of this organization. Because unfortunately, tip number two for professional people, mm-hmm. companies will, won't necessarily pay you what the market will pay you. Mm. And the challenge isn't because they want to hold you back. It's just the reality of it is you can only get a percentage increase when you're a part of a company. You're doing a similar role every year or when you get in line promotions, it's like, yeah, we'll promote you. But the reality of it is you haven't proven yourself. So I went from supervisor to manager. It was my first time. So So are you saying you got to jump companies? You have to. Sometimes you got to promote yourself. And I hate to say it like that. But after about two or three years, you have to start saying, okay, if I want to see a significant change and my compensation, especially if I've taken on an entirely entire new skill like leadership, mm-hmm. I may have to go somewhere else where I can take the knowledge I learned at this company mm-hmm. and apply it at a company that's two steps behind. Got you. And now you're going to see that twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar increase. And and to be honest, from full transparency, I was able to double my salary every two years at one point over a ten year period. Dang, just from like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, you 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 get to a point where it's like, how do you continue to do that? And it's all about being able to create value and then move on from there. So when I left that organization, I went and took on my first director role at a much smaller company. So you're talking about a company of 14,000 people down to a company of a little bit less than a thousand, maybe a few hundred. Right. But my scope was bigger. Right. And it was way more difficult because when you have economies of scale, business gets easier. Right. When I'm like, I am the director and yeah. the company lives and dies by me. I yeah. got to step my game up. And especially when I became a VP, because now the stakes are higher. Mm. Um, so that was really the transition for me was, Hey, I feel comfortable enough to let this go. Cause I trust that it'll be okay. Mm-hmm. But it's time for me to be able to feed my family. When my wife looked me in my eyes and she's like, you know, this, this yeah. money just ain't going to cut it. <laughs> Dang, is that what got you at toast? No, no, that was no. years later. Years you later. Know, you, okay. You know, okay. so, you know, I was a director at this company, became a VP. Then I went to another organization that was a much larger, multi billion dollar company. Mm-hmm. Uh, from there, I left and went to Comcast in Colorado. Mm. What was that like being at such a big company that everyone knows, right? Yeah. Like, is it like there's not room to do what you want because they're so perfect and well oiled? Or do they give you that freedom to do what you want? So here's the funny thing. When I left my first executive role, when I was the fact that one company that was much smaller, because like I, I went from 14,000 to let's say less than a thousand employees, this one company, and I'm a vice president, and I'm gonna go take on a director role at a multi billion dollar company. Mm. So, this company, okay, you're making a couple million, but this is making a couple billion. And I was told, hey, they have a hundred thousand employees at that company, you know, you just be another number, no one's gonna notice you. Right. I go to that company, I dominate. Right. Mm, yeah. <laughs> like they know me, you know, yeah. I made a name for myself. Right. Um, and then when I was leaving that company, it was, Hey, you know, we're two, two, three billion dollar company. We got over a hundred thousand employees. Oh, you go to Comcast, that's a fortune 50 company. You know, it's gonna be very hard to make an impact. They have hundreds of thousands of employees. Yeah. You know, do you really want to go there? Do you, or do you want to be a big fish? What would Comcast part? revenue be like? Oh man. I mean, like 20 billion, like a quarter quarter. Yeah. yeah. Like you're talking about, I mean, they're yeah. literally a top. So the, div- I went to work for the West division. <laughs> The Mm -hmm. West division alone would be a fortune 500 company or a fortune 100 company. That's how much revenue they're bringing in. It it, it was a a crazy situation. So I go ahead and I, I make that leap over to Comcast. And to be honest, I loved it. Right. You know, I thought Comcast was, um, you know, for one, I wanted to work there for several years, but I remember interviewing, I had 12 rounds of interviews, which was tough. 12 rounds, 12 rounds. And let's, I wanna... let's just talk about that in a, in a sense. Right. So people who are going to corporate, why are there so many rounds of interviews? So it depends on the level you're being hired at. Yeah. You're being hired front line. You're probably not going to see more than three or four interviews. Mm-hmm. When you get in management, you may see seven to eight at most. Mm-hmm. When you start getting to the executive level, it's different. 
Right. So everybody needs to check off that box. Right. You know, they're wanting to look at culture fit. They want to look at industry expertise. The one that they don't tell you about that everyone's looking at is executive presence. Mm. No one will ever tell you that you'll never hear that come up in any coaching or development executive, executive presence. presence. How do you carry yourself in the room around other executives? Mm. If I'm in a room, will the CEO of the company feel comfortable with me talking? Mm. My boss will embarrassed by what I'm going to say. That's, that's big. And no that, one thinks about that. And no one thinks about that. And it's not one of those, those things that are easy to do mm-hmm. or to explain to somebody. It's like, you got it or you don't. Yeah. And now you can try to coach towards it, but I've seen people who I always say the highest role to go from is from manager to director. Yeah. Because the expectations are so different. It's not easy going from director to VP easy. I mean, either, but it's easier from going to manager to director. Right. And the reason is because as a manager, I'm expected to be tactical. Even as a senior manager, I'm going to be tactical. I'm going to work with my team. I'm going to try to hit my scores. I'm going to be looking at my team and seeing how they perform. As a director, I'm now responsible of a department, right? So everything I do is not just tactical, but it's also strategic. So how comfortable do I feel letting you own an entire department, right? Right. Do I feel safe in that way? So it's just a whole different ball game. So I see a lot of individuals who struggle to go from that manager to director opportunity because it's a whole different skill set. So with you saying that, talking about corporate, I mean, executive presence, right? Yes. What exactly is an executive profile? Because I remember you telling me that so many people don't know an executive profile. And does they all have any type of similarity of going together? Oh, man. So you think about your executive presence as that's how you walk in a room. That's how you carry yourself. You know, when you see great other leaders, it's kind of that energy you feel from them, right? Where it's like, right. yeah, you know, Steve Jobs on that stage, executive mm-hmm. presence all day. The key about executive profile, no one really talks about it, knows about it. I didn't know about it for years until shout out to Victoria Boston. Um, she was a VP I supported at Comcast. She educated me. Right. I was going for a VP role that was open. And it wasn't so much so I could get the role. It was reps. I mm-hmm. always like to interview as often as possible yeah. to get reps in two ways. It keeps me ready for those, those questions where I'm just like caught off guard. I love being caught off guard and having to answer questions and having to think, keep your mind sharp. Mm-hmm. But then also it gives you an opportunity to present yourself in front of leaders who are making these decisions. And even if they don't choose me now, I will be a person they consider down the line. Or right. I just now have a great relationship or a new mentor. They're like, you know what? I loved our interview. Let's stay connected. So she gave, put me up on game and she said, you need an executive profile. I'm like, what's an executive profile? Yeah. I got my resume. She's like, no. So, you know, I look at the executive profile and what it is, it's for one, it opens it up. It opens up like a book. Right. Like first you see your, your picture, your face, nice smile, yeah. your name. And then you open up as a story about you. It's like a media kit for an executive. Exactly. It is a media kit. Mm -hmm. And you have your nice opening story to explain who you are, your career journey. And I always had that in my resume. Tip number three, Mm -hmm. in your resume, stop having um, objectives at the top of your resume. Yeah, because that's what all we were taught in school, right? Yes. 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 You only have that when you first graduate from school and don't have any experience. Right. At the top of your resume, you want to have career highlight it's like Mm. your highlight reel your ig reel your tiktok right yeah the best things you've done and sell it and make it a story because it's gonna make it so easy for the recruiter Mm. because their job is their ultimate goal is to place you in this job yeah they win when you win Mm. so if i can now take your reel yeah and i can go and say hey here's who tony is tony is an amazing award-winning you know podcast leader business owner and now it 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 breeds oh i gotta know more about tony bring him in Mm, right i like that so at the top of your resume have that so on an executive profile it's a little bit different it's a longer story Mm. you know it's really kind of going in depth and talking about who you are as a person Mm -hmm. then you put in your resume and then at the back of that you're going to want to have more information like what charities are you part of like, mm. what are you doing for the community? You're going to want to highlight special things about you where this media kit is just on a whole different level where you don't have to be afraid about showing your face. Because as an executive, you are going to be the face of a department. Because we were always told one page resume, no longer objective at the top. Yes. And you're telling us no. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So what's the point of when it's appropriate to have an executive profile versus a resume? Because I'm not sure with some positions you send an executive profile that may be like, who is this guy? Yeah. Yeah. I believe in two. You got to have your short firm form resume. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a great website I love to use that creates them. I don't remember their name now, but here's how you can find it. Look up 
Google the CEO of Yahoo's resume. Mm-hmm. And you're going to find this really dope template. It wasn't her actual resume. Yeah. They took her resume and put it on this platform and it makes your resume stand out so well. Canvas is also another great platform, mm-hmm. but you want to have that one little single form resume. And that's typically for if it's for somebody that that, hey, I just need this real quick on the fly. Yeah. You know, at the same time, you're going to have a still short summary about yourself. You're going to put little award achievements there, like make it almost like a mm-hmm. to the eye. But an executive profile that's when you're truly applying for a job. Mm. You know, don't worry about your cover letter and your resume because it's really all that in one. Yeah. So when you're submitting that, and it's really when you're going for an executive role, director or hire, you don't need that for a management role. It's too much. Mm-hmm. Put it there because when you get to the interview, now you need the second part. Mm-hmm. You need to, you have your executive profile, but now you need your executive portfolio. Got you. So how important is the cover letter? Because I hated writing the cover letter. So I, I actually never did cover letters. Okay. What I started doing was I would take that same career summary I told you to do at the top mm-hmm. of your resume, and yeah. that would be my cover letter. Got you. Because people try, they think you should create a cover, le- co- cover letter and it should tie back to, here's why you should hire from me for this role. This is why I'm great. You've got to stand out. Mm-hmm. Like, let's just be real. Recruiters are not, you know, college professors who are grading a paper. They are literally professionals who are looking for important, great people to place. Mm -hmm. So it's all about making their jobs easier. So I always say that cover letter, I either didn't do it or I just had my career summary and pasted that right on in there. Gotcha. And going back to that uh, highlight reel at the top, what would be some examples just off the top of your head that you can come up with that somebody could have? Would it be like help, you know, help increase margins by this, this, and this with a team of a hundred working at this uh, previous company or what would it be like? 100%. You know, I think um, it's so important to be a builder. Yeah. You know, and not everybody's meant to be a builder and I can break that down, but really you want to be able to highlight amazing things you've done, whether Mm. or not it was being a part of a strategic initiatives team, whether or not it was being a part of a project and, I can see people saying, okay, well, I don't control budget. I don't control these things. All I have is my personal things that I do. Well, even as individual contributor, you can still be a part of building something. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're a frontline representative and you see a new team is being stood up, you're like, Hey, can I be a part of that pilot team? Mm -hmm. So now when you look at your resume, you can say, Hey, I was a part of the first team that launched Google AdSense. You know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. now you're a part of that movement. So you're still a part of building something. And those are the things that stand out because employers love to hire people who they understand can go in, take something that was either broken or or needed to be built from scratch. And they did so because they know you're going to come there with expertise, but also you're going to have very, very good problem solving ability. Yeah. And you're going to be an owner, not a renter. I love that. Hey, that was a good one, too. I love that so much, too, because I'm thinking, and especially in the day and age that we're in now, right? Every Our attention spans are so short. Yeah. So it's like, instead of like, back in the day, you got your typical resume, and it's like, I am a driven and passionate individual <laughs> that is looking to give my communication skills to Microsoft, yeah. right? But like you said, what caught my eye with that that highlight reel at the top, if it was just like, You know, like I was a part of the original Google AdSense team. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, We helped develop it and launch it to what it is today. Yeah. Now you've got my interest. Exactly. It's like, what was that like working at the Google, the original AdSense? You see what I'm saying? So now it's like, it's like attracting, not chasing. Yeah. So now me as the recruiter, I'm like, I kind of just want to talk to this guy just because I want to know that answer. And that's where you want to be. So now they're moving you over to this side yeah you know what i mean yeah hey so that was real good for anybody listening what exactly did you call that instead of the objective you called it the ho- a career it's either it's your career highlight it's your highlight mm-hmm. reel your career summary I always you can call it career over overview your mm-hmm. career highlights at the right at the top of your resume you can just put career overview got you got um, you i wouldn't call it highlights on my resume but that's basically how you want to view it got you so let's talk about just corporate world startup culture yeah. right Because I know that, like, now you're in a startup, right? When you worked at Toast, it was a big startup. You know what I mean? So let's just break that down. Someone who's like, like you said, entre exec, right? You love being an executive, but you've got that entrepreneurial vibe, right? Yeah. So it's like, I kind of like the startup because it feels new. Everything's not together. It's not perfect. So let's talk about that a little bit. So the reason why I love the startup world, for one, 
I'll go back to, so I have this formula. It's called the entrepreneur success formula or mm-hmm. the operational success formula, right? Right. And the way that formula breaks down is it's the visionary multiplied by the builder. Oh, sorry. The visionary uh, plus the builder multiplied by the operator. Okay. And what that basically means is a visionary is that usually that person <coughs> who comes up with the ideas, they're the creator. Hey, I have this idea. I really want to start this. I want to spark this. But I'm, I just want to be on the creative side. Right. I don't want to be that person doing anything else. And I'm really that kind of like the spark to the, to, to, the, to, the, to the light. Then you have the builder. That's the person who can say, hey, I need to come in here and either rebuild this. Or I need to build it from the ground up. Mm-hmm. I'm going to come in and create SOPs, guidelines, KPI, structures, yeah. meeting cadence, roles and responsibilities. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do all that. And then number three, you have that operator who's really saying, hey, I want to walk into a business, a building that's already established. All the processes are already there. I'm there to run it and just try to outperform. Can I outperform how I did before? So I've always leaned towards that builder side. I Mm -hmm. love being a builder. So when you join these startups, Mm -hmm. you have an opportunity to be a builder. And it's also, I think out of the three of them, it's the most sexy on a resume. It just is. So as a builder, and the reason why I love startups is that when you join a startup, you are an owner. Mm -hmm. So even though, hey, this is my employer, I have an equitable interest in this organization. Right. There's some big companies like Comcast. They'll give you stock as well. But there's a difference. There's there's hey, I'm going to give you ten thousand dollars worth of stock versus I'm going to give you a couple hundred thousand dollars. Right. You know, where it's like the opportunity for growth and where you can go and build wealth. It's just on a different level. So I I love stars because you get to build. You get to potentially build wealth. Mm -hmm. But then you also get to do what you're still doing. A lot right. of people have the misconception that I got to be an engineer. I have to know how to code to, in order to be in tech. It's not true. Right. Every single job you see needs to be in tech. They're hiring lawyers. They're hiring accountants. Mm-hmm. They're hiring marketing folks. They're hiring contacts and reps. So Every let's, role let's take a pause there then. So like you said, most people who think about tech think about computer engineer, data scientist, IT, yes. right? What's the difference for a lawyer, very traditional, yeah. that works from a traditional law firm to now working in tech? Yeah, so, the, so when you're working in tech, you're going to be, sp- you can either be a general counsel to that organization mm-hmm. where you're really there, you're on payroll, but you're a part of protecting that organization from legal challenges and also getting through different hurdles. Or let's say you're a company like ours where you also need to be able to have lobbyists, you need to be able to uh, communicate with uh, local governments and go through RFPs and let them know, hey, you know, we're a well-qualified brand. We can support your your city, your county, and do it responsibly. So being a lawyer at these organizations, very similar work. It's just targeted. It's focused. So you don't have to worry about, hey, I'm looking at 75 different cases this year. It's This is my business I'm supporting. Mm-hmm. But then, of course, you're typically going to be compensated a lot better because right. you're in that private or that corporate sector. And then on top of that, now you're going to have a lot more equity in the game. So you're, you become just much more of of, of, a, of an owner of that organization versus just being there as an employee. Gotcha. So talking about equity, what was it like at Toast just during IPO? Because I've heard multiple people that I follow that are in like the executive level. Yeah. And they're always talking about like, well, one good thing about when you work with these companies is just the stocks and the shares. And I never truly understood that as much. Yeah. So could you break that down some as well? Yeah. So, you know, when I was brought on, I got, uh, I received stock in essentially over a four or five year vesting period. And that just means that each year, a percentage of my stock is vested. And that, and now I can choose to exercise those, which means I can choose to purchase those shares mm-hmm. at a much lower rate than what it's going for on the market. Gotcha. So, so let's break that down. And so mm-hmm. you get how many shares probably would they give an employee? So let, let's just assume, uh, make it easy, a thousand shares, a right? A thousand shares, So if right. I get a thousand shares, mm-hmm. each of those shares are worth a hundred dollars, let's say. Yeah. So now it's a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Let's share, say that my, my, my price to buy those shares is only $10. So now I have to pay $10,000, but when I pay $10,000 for those shares, they're worth a hundred thousand. My spread and my profit in between is $90,000. Mm. So I've been able to, to, you know, So multiply. you would still have to buy them as an employee. Exactly. Okay. They do have different type of stock called RSUs, which are restricted stock units, mm-hmm. where those are just given to you, where you yeah. don't even have to buy them. It's just, hey, we'll give them to you over time. They're yours. No need to buy them. But you'll get a lot less of those yeah. because it's like free money. Whereas with stock options, I'm going to give you a lot because you still have to buy into them, but at a much lower price. Mm-hmm. And there's certain people, like, for example, at my organization who have like shares at like seven cents, mm. you know, so you think about like you get in early enough. Yeah, it's 
a way for you to come in and spend. So your current days. organization is on the stock market. No, no, we okay. go private, which is okay. awesome. Okay. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about that. Why is that awesome versus not? Because most people look at it like, oh, this is a big publicly traded company. I'm gonna get this. I'm gonna get that. But then private, it's like, let me hear what you meant by that. Yeah. So uh, you know, go, going back to Toast, when I started at Toast, you know, mm-hmm. I get there, the stock I got last uh, would vest over up in four or five years. Toast ahead. the payment company. Exactly. Okay. So if you go to any restaurant, you're going to see toast. You're going to mm-hmm. see where you can swipe. I mean, we're in every metro metro area. Yeah. Um, the shares they gave me, we ended up IPOing towards the end of my first year there. And I remember because my wife and I were actually getting ready to go on a plane to Hawaii for a friend's wedding. So mm-hmm. that same day, it's like surprise IPO. We kept it under wraps, even internally. We didn't know it was going to happen. Right. So then it's like, hey, surprise, we're IPOing today. And the share price that we went to market with, of course, it dropped dramatically after that. That's what happened, especially mm-hmm. the market came down. But in that day, the net value, the profit value of my shares, if I would have stayed there all vesting years, ended up being $2.3 million. Mm. If you would have stayed. If I would have stayed. So think about that, that if I stay somewhere, a job, and let's say you worked there four years, and now my shares are worth this much. And now I'm a millionaire off of having a job for four years. I could choose to retire, share, say, uh, sell all my shares, pay my taxes, and say, you know what? I'm going to kick back for a few years now, or I'm going to become an investor. Mm-hmm. So that was an amazing experience. Now, the thing about it is I came into that company late. Right. So imagine if I came into Toast earlier. Would that have been $20 million? Would that have been $7 million? You know what? So like, some people became millionaires. Oh, yeah. Just off of being a regular employee. A lot of people became millionaires. So should people chase, like, big tech startups? So my recommendation, I actually have a, I have a tool where we break it down. Yeah. There are about five different things you should look at to identify. This is a great company to start, yeah. uh, to join. I'm not going to tell you all of them. Yeah. But I'll tell you, uh, you want to look at the founders. Mm-hmm. The found, what level of experience they have. You want to rate that. Who's investing in that company? Right. But then the, the, the number one thing I look at the most is what round of funding are they in? Mm. So in tech, in the tech world, there's your seed round where you're just like friends and family just to get you started. Then there's your series A mm-hmm. where you're like actually raising money from investors. Then you go B, C, D, and so on. I always say you want to get in around C or D as an employee mm. because now, if you come in at A, you have the biggest upside. You're coming yeah. in there, your shares are two cents. Yeah. You know? But you're probably doing, like, you're, like, really close, right? You're doing highest, a lot of work. You're doing work. a lot. You're working yeah. so many roles, and it's the highest risk. Yeah. Because this company can go, uh, you know what? They ran out of money. They mm-hmm. can't raise money anymore. It's just very high risk. Right. When you wait until, like, C or D, you may have to pay, like, 7 to $15 per share, mm-hmm. right? So you're not getting as much of that upside nowhere near. But it's a startup where there's still enough room for equity because by the time that company goes public, let's say it's worth fifty, sixty dollars a share. Right. Right. So you still can like three to four x your money mm-hmm. um, just by being there. But it's a safer time to be there. So you really want to try to time where is this organization at in their life cycle when mm-hmm. you're joining a tech startup. Um, but like I said, I'm, I'm a big fan of it because if you go join a big tech company like let's say a Meta or Twitter mm-hmm. or whatever it may be. You'll probably get shares and it's going to be a very small amount because they're right. already public. When you join before they're public, you're going to get to be able to buy stock at a much lower rate than the public will ever pay for it. Right. And typically, if the market doesn't go down or if that business can t- continues to do well, mm-hmm. the value of them will just be so much higher than where they are today uh, for what you have to purchase, purchase them for. And your price is your price forever. Mm-hmm. So it's not like, oh, you know, you, you can buy from seven cents, but in two years you got to pay two dollars. Like, no. Yeah. Yeah. You came in on this date. We have yeah. an agreement with you in contract saying, yeah, you can buy these one thousand shares for seven cents. You're going you mm-hmm. can drop seven hundred seventy bucks. <laughs> yeah. And get these shares that are going to be worth one hundred thousand dollars. Right. Yeah. So it's just a, it's an opportunity to build wealth in a completely different way. See, I think what you need to do, because there's so much like. People could look at corporate like it's just corporate, plain and dry, saltine cracker, right? Yeah. I think you should put something together where it's like people listening can grab this and learn about the different plays and avenues to really scale personally yeah. within corporate. Because people look at it like clock in, clock out, but yeah. it's so much more that you could be doing that people aren't seeing the pros they're just looking at like money and cons. Yeah. But what are all the pros that come with working these types of jobs? Exactly. You see what I'm saying? You know, you, you, you speaking of that, two things. Number one, mm-hmm. your job will be your number one investor. Yeah. Period. 
So if you want to start your own business, if you want to become an investor in the market or in real estate, mm -hmm. go to work happy. Yeah. Because you're and just know I'm taking this money. Let's say I'm making 50 grand a year. Can I live off of 30? Right. And can I find a way to save that other 20? And I'm yeah. this is next. You know, got to pay your taxes. Right, right, right. <laughs> can I find a, another way to use that and maybe say, okay, you know, I want to get into shop. Uh, I want to get into drop shipping. I want to get mm -hmm. into real estate. I want to get into clothing. Like, yeah. there's other things you can do with that money. So as your, your job is now investing in that business for you, you're growing it and your job is teaching you skills. So when you start having a business on the side, you start looking at your company different. So you're like, okay, yeah. How do we do our accounting? Yeah. Okay. How do we, how do we market? Yeah. How do we make sure we have a proper organizational structure? Yeah. Because now, you know, you're in paid school to apply yep. to your own business. Yep. Right. And then number two, I was just reading an article today about Mr. Nadella. He's the CEO of Microsoft now. Yeah. He started off as an employee at Microsoft 22 years ago. Mm. He's now the CEO. They just dropped a video of him doing like an in-company uh, video about uh, Excel and kind of walking people how to use Excel. Yeah. But like he started off as a mid-level manager. Mm. Today he's worth $700 million. That's crazy. Now I can tell you 95% of entrepreneurs will never be worth $700 they million. Won't. They dollars. They all, they all. And this is an employee. And, and we have a lot of situations like that. Andrew Nui, one of my favorite CEOs, she was the CEO of PepsiCo. Same thing, rose up the ranks mm. and became the CEO of PepsiCo. Yeah. So you don't. I mean, that's the Tim Cook this. story. Tim Cook, mm -hmm. Apple, perfect example. Yeah. So don't sleep on being able to grow in a company. The key is find a way to stay growing. Don't right. become stagnant. You have to grow. They can't grow you. You got to grow yourself. Right. How important, and I'm asking this from an entrepreneur side because I'm kind of geeking out on these, are SOPs in corporate world? SOPs are everything in the sense of if I disappear tomorrow, if my team disappeared tomorrow, can the next generation come in and run the play? Got you. And SOPs are what get you from being a reactive organization to a proactive. Mm. We've all either ran businesses or worked for businesses where it's like every problem just threw you off. It all threw you off. Yeah. And I'm a real big person that you have to build an organization with momentum. Mm -hmm. You know, John Maxwell has my favorite quote. He says, you could take a train going 50 miles an hour and it can break through a five foot thick steel reinforced wall without ever stopping. Mm. But if you take that same train when it's not moving, you take a small one inch brick and put it at this wheel it can't even build up any momentum. It'll stay still. Mm. So the key is how do you build an organization with momentum? And it's about creating SOPs and guidelines. And no matter yeah. what happens, we know the baseline of what we do. So let's say 80% of what we need to do, mm -hmm. we have like clockwork. We know our key KPIs. We know our roles. We know our missions. We know our cadence. And the other 20% you allow for being flexible. Mm. You never want to be a perfectly mapped out company. Yeah. It's too rigid. So you got to leave enough room for, you know, innovation, for serendipity. But you got to have your SOPs because especially as an entrepreneur, so if I'm a business yeah. owner, I can't fire myself until I have an SOP to hand off to my VA mm. or to another person I'm hiring. You speaking because I'm looking at like that's what I'm on right now. Like, how do I build SOPs? And, you know, I'm seeing these websites that sell them, but I'm like, I need SOPs. One, systems, right? Yes. Make stuff bulletproof. Two is just the way it's just like it's just organizing everything because so many of us as entrepreneurs. Yeah. Me speaking of entrepreneur. The company gets so instilled in you mm -hmm. as the small business owner where you're the all seeing SOP yeah. and you never can leave. Yeah. So the biggest issue that small business owners go through is they can't fire themselves. Yes. So any entrepreneur listening to this right now, what I just heard from you is until you have SOPs around your entire processes, there's no side of you leaving your business. So that's the challenge right now to any entrepreneurs to build those SOPs yeah. so that, like you said earlier, you can replace yourself as a leader because you as the entrepreneur don't trust yourself leaving. Yes, you see what I'm exactly. saying? Exactly. So yeah, I mean, that was deep. That, so that cash flow quadrant. Stuff yeah. Right there. Cash flow quadrant. Yeah. So, um, going into the man, we got to talk about the cash flow quadrant. We got to talk about cannabis. <laughs> Let's just talk about cannabis real quick. Yeah. Cause that's the hot topic, right? What made you say, I'm going to get into a cannabis business. You know, most people are like, Weed, you know, your parents are like, you going you doing what now? Yeah. So like, how did you get into cannabis? Well, I think in my lifetime, I've seen several gold rushes. Mm -hmm. And the first one I saw in my lifetime was the internet. Mm -hmm. I was too young, still in middle school, can do elementary and middle school, nothing I could do about it. The second one I saw was social media. Mm -hmm. You know, the third one I saw was cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. The fourth one I'm seeing cannabis. Mm. And what I mean by that is it's we're talking about these early stages of these um, 
industries that have the opportunity to eventually treat, create hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars in revenue. Right. And we're at the earliest stages right now. The, the total, um, uh, the total accountable market for, for cannabis is only like 20 to $30 billion mm-hmm. in about two years. It'll be 50 billion mm. in 10 years. Imagine what it'll be. Right. You know, you're going to be talking about hundreds of billions. Uh, so I see an industry that is, we're just still early on, even though I'm late. So it's like, if you join Bit, you started buying a Bitcoin when it was $2,000, you're like, Oh, it's already 2000. It's so high. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the reality of it is now it's even at a low at 16,000. Right. right. So it's, it's, a, it's never really too late. So we're in a situation with cannabis where it's not too late to come in. So from an economic standpoint, I'm like, we get to be a part of this industry while it's early on. And I want to represent, you know, I'm an African-American, former homeless, <laughs> high school turned college dropout. Right, right. <laughs> who is in tech and does not necessarily do tech. Yeah. Um, and I want to be able to represent and be a face and say, hey, you can look up to me. And if you see me, you can be me. If you see me, you can beat me. Right. Mm-hmm. So I really thought it was important to have representation in this industry because unfortunately, the barrier to entry, if you want to open up a dispensary, is like almost half a million dollars on average. Mm. So there's not a lot of us walking around with that cash liquid. You're not getting a loan right. to get in this industry mm. because it's very regulated. So you're in a position where they can't bank. So you're talking about basically 99.9.9% of black people yeah. can, are not in this space. Yeah. So how do you come and join? Um, and that's on the professional side. But there's a personal side of why I decided to join as well. Mm. What was, um, have you ever seen the show Billions? Oh, I haven't watched it yet. I was watching it and they're getting into Axe just opened up a bank, right? Yeah. Got a bank charter. And he's like, how can we get cutting edge? And he tries to buy a cannabis company. And they're literally like, there's a whole section of the business that's just for breezing the money, packing up tons and tons of cash. Yeah. And they're having trucks take it to the bank. Yeah. And the reason for that is because you're saying you can't bank, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not bankable. That's you know, crazy. you're not doing any credit card transactions. You know, we're, there's some debit card trans- transactions that can happen, mm-hmm. but it's very difficult, difficult. And that's why we're trying to get the Safe Banking Act passed through Congress, because mm. it's going to be so important because it's a lot of work and it's right. dangerous. Requiring that much cash to flow these companies yeah. is risky. A lot of robberies, but also to have to have armed guards and and, and trucks having to pick up this cash. It's heavy. It's expensive. Right. So none of this is, is, is affordable. So it hurts their margins as well. Um so, but yeah, yeah. It, What's it like for investors right now? Because I'm sure you got investors that are probably like, oh, this is hot. They want to be on it first. But then there's, like you said, the high risk side. Like, I can just imagine it's just like, we can't even look at our money. Like, I mean, they can put it in the bank, right? Yeah. 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 There's certain banks you're not going to get in like a Wells Fargo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there are certain smaller banks that will do it. And I, I'm assuming they're doing those as like portfolio accounts, which mm-hmm. just means that bank owns and it's not federally insured. Yeah. So if anything happens, oh, your cash is gone, you know? Oh, so, man. um, but invest from an investment standpoint, oh, it's still a gold rush. Yeah. Now this year, when you look at the market, the market will show you just like tech cannabis is down. When you look at the stock market, there are cannabis stocks out there mm-hmm. um, and the market's down right now. But the reality of it is when we saw the Safe Banking Act almost get passed, you start seeing stocks shoot up. Right. So yeah. we know there's going to be an inflection point where once the government feder- federally approves banking for this industry, it's going to go up. But at the same time, I think just with the market being down overall, everyone's being nervous. Yeah. If everything was was normal, this is still a very hot market to be in mm. because you're still so early. I mean, we're probably if we were talking about raising a child, maybe this child right now is three years old. Mm. What do you think's tanking the markets? I mean, of course, it's the economy, but these companies that are so big to fail. Right. Yeah. Shopify laid off a lot. Amazon, biggest layoff ever. Is the economy really just that bad and these companies are doing bad or what is it? I think companies are trying to be smart. And what mm-hmm. I mean by that is... So they're not hurting for cash. No. Yeah. They're trying to make sure they don't because they know cash used to be cheap. Mm-hmm. You know, for 10 years, cash was so cheap. When you're looking at interest rates that are like... Like the federal interest rate was like 0% at one point. Mm-hmm. You know, 1%, 2%. Cash was so cheap. And you even see a company like Apple who was sitting on hundreds of billions of dollars in cash, yet still got loans to do things. Yeah. Because the cash... Keeping my cash hoard was cheaper than me getting a loan from you guys, yeah. you know, and I could keep my cash over the here. The value of money. it was more than the interest rate. Exactly. Yeah. So you, you're in a position where like, wait a minute, I only have to pay you, you know, 
two percent of this. Okay. Yeah, facts. Okay. You know. Yeah. So and that, now my opportunities, you know, where I can invest. So I think what's happening right now is we're seeing companies say. We don't want to be in the position we were 2008, 9, 10, 11. Right. We don't want the banks to catch us. So a lot of these companies, especially in tech, they're hiring proactively. Mm-hmm. So they're saying, okay, hey, we want to spin up this new department to focus on this specific industry. Mm-hmm. And we don't even have a product to sell yet or this product still in its infancy. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, what is it? Google VR or yeah. what was Google Glass? <laughs> uh, Google Glass, yes. yeah. Like if I'm, if I'm Google and I have that department and I might say, hey, you know what? I don't want to invest there right now. Right. So uh, let me go ahead and pull back. And that entire department, unfortunately, will be laid 100 off. 100 people gone. Exactly. But then even across the board, every department bakes growth into their headcount. And, mm-hmm. and I mean, I want to hire you before I need you. Right. Try to bring you on, develop you, make sure you're ready. Then in like three months, when we actually need you, boom, you're there. Well, when the, everything slows down and sales are slowing down, you know what? I don't need all these people because the growth is not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of companies are really contracting so they won't have to uh, burn the cash they already have. And they're trying to protect their burn rate on cash. Got you. That makes sense. That makes sense. And then like talking about let's go into your personal endeavors, right? Yeah. Like you have this executive job. But then we also want to talk about how you don't have to just do that. Like you're like you said, your main job is your investor, right? Yeah. So you can do other things like you do real estate, you do corporate dad, right? Yeah. So how do you balance being an entrepreneur outside of your main job? Oh, man. So balance is an interesting word. Mm -hmm. I think you have to find a way to eventually interweave them. Yeah. Right. And, And do it in a way where it doesn't cause you to create fiction between friction between anything else. Cause you also do speaking, which I see on your LinkedIn yeah. as well. Yeah. So let, let's go back to the cash flow quadrants, right? Mm-hmm. So when you think about it, there's the E for employee, right? right? There is the S for self-employed. Mm-hmm. There is the B for business owner. Mm-hmm. And there's the I for investor. Right. So in our minds, we think, okay, here's the hustle. I got to go from being an employee. Well, then I need, what I need to do is the next step, let me become a consultant and do some speaking so I never have to work for anybody, but I'm really working for myself. Right. And then the next phase is let me create SOPs and maybe I hire other speakers and other consultants over me, under me, and they can follow my play. Now I'm the business owner and they're running with the play. Right. And then there's the, you know what? Let me become an investor. Let me sell everything mm-hmm. and now just invest. And now I'm just a, v, I'm a venture capitalist or an angel investor. And I sit back and just collect money, you know? Yeah, so the issue is everyone wants to accidentally put themselves in only one box. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We're all trying. We think we're having to dance through. Whereas what you can do, you can say, okay, in my day job, my day job is what's going to bring me in. It's going to make me bankable. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs, listen to this word. Right. Bankable. Bankable. (laughs) Jeez, buying a house was hard as an entrepreneur. Exactly. One of the hardest things to do is to buy a house as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. One of the hardest things to do is get funding for your business early on because you will have to do personal guarantees, unfortunately. Yes. So when they see that you're bankable, you have a strong credit score and a strong W-2. Right. It's easy. Doors unlock. You know, I've been able to. Yes. Like my W-2 has allowed me to unlock hundreds of thousands of dollars in lines of credit for my businesses. Mm -hmm. Not my business. My W-2 has helped me do that. Mm -hmm. along with my personal credit so what you can do is you take that business and now that's that's keeping you you live off that business Mm -hmm. don't live off anything else just that business right i mean Mm -hmm. just your job your job your job your employee and then from there what i did was my s is i'm a corporate speaker and a corporate workshop facilitator hence corporate dad that's your self-employed gig yes where i I do it all on my own because you gotta use your time exactly i gotta travel i gotta gotta actually conduct the workshops i gotta conduct conduct the speeches i gotta build the content i don't have a team help me there it's just me doing it and it's Mm -hmm. like a passion project um then number three uh the b for me was business owner Mm -hmm. that's my real estate business right that's where not as an investor per se but as a builder where i'm going and i'm flipping houses and i'm building new construction homes and i'm doing that by leveraging a team where it's hey i'm not the one putting up the drywall i'm yeah i'm hiring a subcontractor to go out and do that work i'm hiring a project manager to oversee the operations to make sure everything gets done and that we're going to hit our budget so i have an actual business that's running when i'm not there i still do my check-ins it's tough to be on top of it but i'm not giving it more than a few hours a week right and then there's the i that's yeah. the investor where i'm investing in crypto i'm investing a little bit in stock right mm-hmm. so i'm able to do all four and it's about time management to your point it's like how do you do it it's like like we have the excuse of there's only but so much time in a day and it's like okay well the reality of it is if i wake up early 
you know, I can stay on top of what's going on. I can plan my day out, get my content done. Mm-hmm. Right. If I, if I can work a little bit later, I can check in with my contractors, make sure everything needs to be done the way it needs to be going. Mm-hmm. So it's all about time management. We have the time, but we choose to put it into social media or into procrastination. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, everybody watching, that's like definitely the, uh, the challenge. Well, so we had a challenge earlier, right. Which yeah. was, Small business owners create an SOP so that you can fire yourself, so that yes. you can trust fire yourself. The second is whether you're an entrepreneur or in the corporate world, understanding the cash flow quadrant so that you don't box yourself in yeah. by sitting in one category. You yes. know what I mean? You can be in all of them. At least try to be in two of them. Yes. You see what I'm saying? So that's the challenge right there. With doing that, what are some of the challenges you face being an entrepreneur, though, working corporately because this is the difference for me as an entrepreneur i'm all in Mm -hmm. i have to be all in because there is no safety net yeah you have safety net it may be yeah don't really want to put that much time in the business today you see what i'm saying i don't do it i don't eat you still eat just slower pace for your second income yeah i I think the biggest challenge is i'm not as good as an executive as i am in my business as i am at my employer Mm. I'm a much better executive for my employer. Mm. And and what I mean by that is we tend to make sure that the operations and organizations being ran at an optimal level because you want to, you understand there's hundreds of people depending on me. I got to make sure I'm doing this right. Whereas in my business, I can kind of say, do we need to follow SLPs this time? I'm a little bit Mm -hmm. too flexible where I need to really make sure the same way I put rigor here, I need to have rigor there as well. And I said, the other thing is to your point, the safety net. You know, if things start going wrong in the business, I have a W-2 that I'll start taking that money to start protecting the business. I'll start, hey, let me go mm-hmm. ahead and add money to the business to keep this going. Whereas if I didn't have that, mm-hmm. I'd have to say, okay, how else can I make this business run? Maybe, okay, if we're not selling enough, clearly I'm not putting out a product that people want. So how do I make a better product? Mm-hmm. So it's almost stifles a little bit of your in- innovation. Yeah. So there are trade-offs to this. You know, I think yeah. there was a, um, you know, a great study that said, like, we always think we can multitask. Mm-hmm. The reality of it is, when you multitask, you're not saying, okay, I'm taking 100% of my brain, mm-hmm. 50% on doing this, 50% on doing this. No, it actually becomes 40-40 mm. because you're losing uh, efficiency. You're losing momentum when you're having to switch your brain. Gotcha. So I try to strategically say, I'm not going to think about real estate on these days or these gotcha. times. So I compartmentalize. When I'm working on work, I'm working on work. And when I'm working on real estate, I'm working on real estate. When I'm working on corporate debt, I'm working on corporate debt. Mm, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. And then how important is just what most people get hung up on benefits yeah. with working the corporate job? Cause my mom was always like, you should work a corporate job so you can get your benefit package and then do your entrepreneurial business. Entrepreneur Tony says, like you said, how startups are, I'm all about growth, 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 growth. Yeah. We worry about that later. You having a family, where does that come in at? Cause I know a lot of people yeah. deal on that. I have three boys, which mm. means they like to hurt themselves. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so benefits are critical. Now, going back to being able to be bankable, it's also to be able to have the other B, benefits, right? Mm-hmm. Because the reality of it is, if I was by myself, I could probably care less. Right. Like, I'll be fine. You yeah. know, my risk tolerance is very high. <laughs> right, 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 right. So I'm willing to go all in and say everything's gone tomorrow. Whereas when you start having family or dependents, maybe you're taking care of your mom. Maybe you're mm. taking care of your dad. Like, you don't even have to just have kids you have to move a little bit different, right? Right. So having an opportunity to have benefits and especially in startups, sometimes you would think, Oh, if I go work for a tech startup, they're not going to have the best benefits. Sometimes they have the better than the big organizations. That's what I heard. Because they really want to provide the best perks to their people. And I think especially when it comes to mental health and when it comes to your well being, they kind of lean in a lot heavier there than a major organization can and or will. Um, so I, I think benefits are critical. Like mm. it's just, you have to know where you are on your journey. If you don't have, you know, a big family or if you're at a point where you're like, hey, I have a spouse, maybe we can lean on their benefits, go for it. But even as an entrepreneur, there's oper- they're, they're, they're specific insurance out there for you, mm-hmm. you know. So I remember when I was planning my exit from corporate, you know, I had a plan yeah. on, OK, I'm going to save up this much. We're going to take this. I'm going to live off of this. I was already looking at what are the big benefits that I need to purchase out there and can mm-hmm. I prepay it for the year? Like, What can I do to take that burden off my mind? Right. Yeah. So I think benefits are so important. Dope, dope. Well, shoot, that's the Answer Exec podcast. What, what do you, what do you want to leave people with from the today's hour and fifteen minute conversation? Yeah, you know the guy that's either thinking, you know, I want to go corporate, but I'm not good enough. 
right? Yeah. Because I don't got the degree or the certification to the person who's I'm in this job and I feel stuck. I feel like I'm not innovative enough. Yeah. What do you have to say to them being a person that's been able to be in multiple boxes of this cash flow quadrant? Yeah, you know, going back to some of the things I said earlier, for one, career happiness is key. Mm-hmm. You got to know your purpose. You got to know what that is. And a lot of people don't. Not your passion. Mm-hmm. Your passion won't always make you money. Mm. You need to become passionate about what you're doing. Right. Passion is a moving target. And people think, oh, I want to be passionate. No, what's your purpose? And and a key way that I say you do that is go back to when you were a child. Yeah. Before you got influenced by your parents saying you should be a doctor, lawyer, engineer. What did you want to be when you were a child? What was that? Mm-hmm. You know, and identify who that who that individual was and maybe hey when i was a kid i really wanted to be a superhero mm, yeah <laughs> and not like a little bit like i die hard wanted to be one like it was everything that was in me and why was that well i really wanted to be in a role where i helped other people mm. at it and i really wanted to be in a role where i was significant you know i really wanted to be in a role where i looked good doing it mm. <laughs> you know yeah. so if you, so if you look at your career and you say hey this is what i'm looking for Take that. That's what your purpose is, right? Same as if you were an athlete. Mm -hmm. You didn't care about football or basketball. You cared about being on a winning team. You Mm. cared about building a legacy. You cared about pushing your personal limitations. So you want to find roles that fit those parameters of your purpose. Mm. So you got to get those locked in. Yeah. And then going back to what I was saying earlier as well, you know, how I got to where I am. Number three, study ethic. Number two, tell stories. Your career has to tell a story. But number one, I never touched on it. What is it? Take risks. Take risks. I wouldn't. And you don't hear that word a lot in your in your field. Yes. You hear entrepreneurs are too risk taking, but take the safe route and get a job. Yes. Mm-hmm. And and the reality of it is, I would not be where I am or halfway where I am if I didn't take risks. Mm. I had to take really big bets on myself. Moving to Mexico with a young family, risky. Moving to Colorado across the country, risky. Taking on roles at much smaller organizations that were, you know, very shaky, risky, jumping to a much larger organization where I could be drowned out, risky, Mm. putting myself hand up in the middle of a meeting with our division president and saying, hey, I have an idea for how we can start uh, uh, an incentive program that I launched at a company a couple of years ago when I was a VP. And they're looking at me like this isn't even your role. Yeah. Risky. Mm. You know, you have to be willing to put yourself out there. Stop saying I'm only going to do what's in my job description. Because if you only do what's in your job description, I have no reason to ever promote you. Mm. I'll give you your 3% increase every year for the rest of your life. Thank you for being a great employee. Mm. But when I see that you're stretching yourself and I see that you want to be part of something bigger, I want to help you get there. Yeah. Because as leaders, we win when we create more leaders. We create, we win when we create and develop you. So please, please don't be afraid to take risks mm-hmm. and sit in that role for 10 years when you know by now you should be a regional director. Mm. And before we end, one more thing I want to say when you said risky taking a job at a smaller role. What about those people who did make great money for a big company? Let's use Twitter as an example, right? Yeah. And then things happen and they take a job that pays less, right? Yeah. Um, what, what do you have to say about that when people are like, should they get stuck in the box of like, I can't go mm. down, even if it's like they're repotting themselves to get bigger? Yeah. Oh, I love that repotting. Oh, yeah. Ooh. A little bar. <laughs> a little bar. <laughs> Here's how life is. Mm-hmm. So if you look at my career, I've never gone down in money, mm-hmm. but I've gone down in titles. Mm. So I went, like I said, from call center rep to workforce analyst, to senior analyst, to supervisor, to manager, to global manager, to director, to vice president, down to director, mm-hmm. a lateral over to an even bigger director, to senior director, back to vice president. Mm-hmm. Now, each role paid me more money than the last one, right? But I didn't get so caught up in, I need this title, right? Because I understood scope was more important. So sometimes in life, you have to allow yourself to be a slingshot. Mm. What that means is, you have to allow yourself to get pulled back to launch forward. Mm -hmm. Everything is not going to be a perfect straight shot. So especially if you're having to take a pay cut, this may be an opportune time to say, okay, what company can I go to strategically? That's going to help me get to where I want to be next. Right. Mm -hmm. What role can I take on? It's going to help me get to where I want to be next. And then is there something that I should be doing in the S column, the Mm -hmm. self-employed column that I can do on the side? 
to now make up for that difference. Because a lot of us have this entrepreneurial itch in us mm-hmm. and we need something to motivate us. Right. So if you left Twitter and you went from making, let's say you, you went from making a hundred thousand, now you're going to make 75,000 in the same role before a different company. What can you leverage at that company? Does it give you more time? Great. You're not yeah. working as hard. So now you can find a way to come up with other 25,000 in a different way. Right. Whether it's through investments, whether it's through self-employment. Cash flow quadrant. Cash flow quadrant. Mm. You know, so it's not always about it being perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be able to move forward and understand how to navigate. And at this season, what do I need to learn to help me get to that next level? Mm, That's deep. So, Sean, thank you for being on the show. Where can people find you, connect with you at, learn more about what you got going on? Yeah. So, you know, for my corporate dad, for my speaking and workshops, you go to corpdad.com, C-O-R-P-D-A-D.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, for Instagram, it's Sean Elenry, S-E-A-N-I-L-E-N-R-E-R-E-Y. Um, Instagram, C-O-R-P-D-A-D, Corp Dad. I'm yeah. on TikTok, but I got one TikTok. So. Yeah, one TikTok. <laughs> what about the LinkedIn crowd? Because I know you're pretty heavy on there. Professionals. 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 <laughs> if you, you now if you're an executive, I'm really mad at you. But if you are not on LinkedIn today, mm-hmm. and then what I mean by not on, I mean like uh, you could have a little profile. <laughs> but if you're not active, if I see you on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook mm-hmm. more than I see you on LinkedIn, it's a problem. Why? Because LinkedIn is the new marketplace for employees. That's where you've got, that is the farm of where recruiters are going to farm you and to grab you and pull you into the organizations. Mm -hmm. And it's changed the dynamic because now you're not just going to get a resume. I can actually become a thought leader. Mm. So on LinkedIn, if I post photos, if I post messages, if I post videos, I'm putting out articles. I'm now, let's say I was in the recruiting space. I'm now... I can have 10,000 followers on LinkedIn just to hear what I have to say about recruiting and the best practices that you could take. Mm. Now, every company out there is looking at me like this is somebody I want in our company. Yeah. Because go- going back to my earlier point, you are no longer an employee. Mm-hmm. As an employee, you are now a- your own brand, your own company partnering with this larger organization. Mm. So companies want to partner with other great companies. Yeah. You know, so how do you make sure you market yourself? And I promise you, if you increase your engagement on LinkedIn and really stand out and get a nice career highlight reel on there as well, Mm -hmm. opportunities will come to you. You said this earlier, Tony, you said you want to attract. And that's what exactly attract, not chase. And LinkedIn allows you to do that. It puts you in the driver's seat and now you can make choices. And we all know Mm -hmm. your people it's if you get sourced into a company versus you applying for that company, you're already higher up on the priority list mm. because they had to come after you. You didn't come after them. Right. Mm, that's the, well, y'all, y'all know what to do. Click the description below. Follow my guy, Sean, follow him on everything he does from on LinkedIn, tap in with him, connect with him. We'll see y'all on the next episode. Let's go. Let's go.